Her Sports Six Nation Show in association with Opal. Hello and welcome to episode four of the Her Sports Six Nations show brought to you by Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode in the series on YouTube and our social channels or listen to the podcast on every podcast app. So in round three, we saw Ireland get their first win against Italy. What did you make of the match? Yeah, look, um, great to get off the board, get a bit of confidence into the squad and um, a deserved win against a poor Italy side but again they still had to be beaten we still had to put in a good performance and it was nice to have a really good crowd there it for it to be a home match and just to to get a good performance on the board was really really important and hopefully they can then kick on for the last two games of the Six Nations and and improve on this but it was a really nice stepping stone it felt like the tide had turned a little bit and, and we were moving on to, to bigger and better things. And Catherine Dane in at that nine position, it's something you've kind of been calling for for a few weeks. Do you think she made a difference in the game? Yeah, look, and again, like there's nothing on Avian Riley. I just thought that we needed a little bit of experience in that uh, halfback position. You know, she's been around a long time. She knows exactly what she needs to do and, and how to play to get the team moving forward. And I thought she did her job really well. You know, her passes were crisp and they were out in front. They gave the forwards momentum into that carry to give uh, us that go forward ball. And it just freed up a lot of space uh, for our back line, which we know can do damage and did do damage at the weekend. So I thought she did a really good job. And when Avian Riley came on, she kind of kept that up a little bit. And, you know, which is nice to see her being able to build that experience. And overall, there seems to be a nice little partnership working there. and. You know, there's a, a bright future ahead in, in that halfback position. And we had a few key players from the game, the likes of Sam Monahan, Stacey Flood, Eve Higgins. Obviously, Sam got the player of the match, but if you were to pick it, who would, who would have been your player? Uh, look, that's put me in a bit of a tight situation. I think all three players played really, really well. You know, Sam um, has been exceptional throughout the tournament. Her first Six Nations, you know, she's really stepped up as a a leader in that pack in that second row um, alongside Nicola Friday and I've just been really impressed with her physicality and her strength and her aggression but also kind of the skill and the talent that she has on show to be able to make those deft passes and offloads and create opportunities for her teammates. Stacey Flood and Eve Higgins have created a wonderful partnership in midfield uh, that's allowing us play this free-flowing brand of attacking rugby and both of them have exquisite skill sets. They're both well able to tackle, to carry, to pass, to use their footwork. And um, you know, Stacey Flood has one of the best passes uh, of any player in this in this tournament, um, and she uses that to the full extent to try and get our, our lethal wingers away. But herself and Eve are working really, really well and. You know, Eve scored that wonderful try um, with a smile on her face, showing her she's really enjoying it. But I thought Stacey pulled the strings a lot at 12. Just her range of kicking uh, was phenomenal, keeping the Italians guessing, making sure that they were, you know, awake in the backfield, keeping Ireland on the front foot. And yeah, she, she's an exceptional talent. And the best part is they have years of good rugby mm -hmm. again. But you can see that they've been playing together for a long time. They're at the same club and railway. They're both in the sevens team um, and it's been a really great partnership there and I hope that we can build on that uh, and see that over the next couple of years. And do you think we'll ever see her back in at that 10 position or is she kind of comfortable now in the centre? Look, I don't know, but I think isn't it great to have that option and that mm -hmm. versatility? Um, I do think she's probably a little bit suited better at that 12 position. She has a little bit more time and she doesn't have as much pressure on her to be making all the decisions at once and kind of trying to boss the forward she can focus on her own game and releasing that back line but you know another opportunity might arise where we do play her at that 10 position um but either way i think you have to have her on the pitch because uh, she's a game changer for sure so then a 29-8 win for ireland and then england and wales is 58-5 any surprises there or what did you think of the match yeah, no, look, uh, Wales, obviously coming into that game off the back of two wins would have been brimming with confidence, you know, need no motivation to, go, to come up against England, but England's class and superiority just showed and the depth they have in their squad, they're able to make numerous changes. We saw Jess Breach coming in for the first time, you know, uh, Libby Thompson, who scored a hat-trick the last game, didn't even make the 23, you know, and that just shows 
the talent that they have there and while Wales were brave and they, they fought very hard, you know, England dominated from start to finish and that result was only going to, you know, there was ever only going to be one winner mm-hmm. in that game. And do you think Wales put up a good fight against them or could they have done a bit more? No, I do. I think they played quite well. Wales actually um, made a few changes, mm-hmm. which I was quite surprised at coming into this game because they had been unchanged from the Ireland game uh, going into their second game and then here they made a few changes they changed their halfback pairing um you know and Ellie Snowsell and Kira Bevan dropped to the bench so that was quite unusual because they had been controlling the game a little bit um but they, they made a few changes trying to again build that squad depth going into the World Cup and it's a nice way to look at it doing it in the England game it obviously didn't really work out for them but maybe they had an eye on other games that they were targeting on and focusing on and wanted to give those players a rest. Mm-hmm. And then a 28-8 scoreline for Scotland and France. Do you think it would have been higher or what did you make of that one? Yeah, I thought that was quite a low score for France yeah. considering what we've seen of them before. But uh, the game was littered with mistakes and it was very, very sloppy from France. And they kind of, the halftime break seemed to do them more harm than good and they, they kind of lost their cohesion and... Their tempo seemed to be a little bit all over the place. Again, made numerous changes, trying to, again, get more players that experience and that depth. Do you think the changes maybe made a bit choppy, like, playing? Because there was a lot of penalties, people were coming on, and it wasn't helping, obviously. Yeah, well, like, at the start, absolutely not, because I thought that they got four tries in the first half. They had a bonus point wrapped up, and I thought they were well on their way to, you know, maybe hitting that 50-point mark. Um, But... Yeah, second half just didn't happen for them and it wasn't quite going right. Scotland really put up a massive fight, you know, and um, I just thought that that's kind of France for you. They can be quite unpredictable. They're not always brilliant. And we have seen in the past that away from home, they're not, you know, they're not fantastic. And, And the last time that Scotland and France played in Scotland, it was a draw. So... Uh, Scotland were always going to fight for that. France were superior, but I do think the changes kind of um, just caused a little bit of cohesion issues and, and stuff like that. But look, still an easy enough win for them mm-hmm. in the end. So round three, I think it sets up, I suppose, in two weeks' time, the next game's quite, it'll be quite exciting to see what happens. But looking back to Ireland and Italy, what were the key moments that stood out for you? So obviously the set piece there was very well improved. Yeah, look, a huge positive to come from that was that we actually uh, forced Italy into conceding four scrum penalties, which is massive, again, considering we're not the biggest team, we're not the biggest pack, but... There just seemed to be a huge shift in attitude and focus around the set piece and we got a lot of reward from that, which was really exciting. I thought Christy Haney had a huge impact coming in for her first Six Nations start. The home crowd obviously giving them a bit of a lift. There was a huge media build-up of this and, you know, Italy were there for the taking. They also came into this game with uh, two losses, you know, and... It was nice to see us really take control and take charge of that. But definitely getting four scrum penalties uh, is a huge win for that front row. A uh, huge learning curve. Our line-out mall attack and defence was a lot better. Neve Jones uh, ended up getting a try at the end of that as well. Her first Six Nations try. Um, so it was fantastic to see from that. Uh, look, there was plenty of positive moments. Lucy Hall getting over for the first try of the game. Her first uh, try in a 15s jersey, which is great to see. And you could see the smile on her face. And there was a lovely image going around of Lucy scoring her try. And in the background, Stacey Flood and, and Eve Higgins and uh, Amy Lee murphy Crow jumping for joy in that. And that really highlights kind of the team cohesion and unity they have. And you can see they're building on that and really getting to know each other. Um, Katie O'Dwyer came off the bench, made a big impact, got her first try, a little bit fortuitous, but look, she needed good footwork and good hands to take it, and they all count, and obviously, try it around, uh, Eve Higgins, beautiful dink in behind from Catherine Dane off her left foot, her, her weaker foot, Eve judged it beautifully, and a great try, and again, smiling as she's scoring it, you know, just showing that they're loving their rugby, they love when they actually get to play that lovely brand of uh, attacking rugby, and it shows we're a really good team when we can keep the ball and hold on to it and, and move it. And then we obviously had Aoife in there for her first cap, but then she got a subsequent yellow card. As a player, what would that feel like? Yeah, look, um, Aoife Wafer, obviously, you could see she was a little bit upset and emotional when the yellow card came. Probably a little bit too exuberant um, when she came on in that back row, in that 
uh, she just kind of got the clear out timings a little bit wrong and mm -hmm. ended up rolling her player which you can't do anymore but what I loved about her character and her resilience was that she came back on you know she didn't say I'm not going to put my hands on the rock anymore mm -hmm. for fear that happens again and a couple of minutes later she went back in and she won a turnover penalty in in the rook and it is hard and you know you've just come on your first cap you're full of emotion yeah, full of adrenaline, her. <laughs> and then you have to go sit in a plastic chair for 10 minutes and know that you may have cost your team but i just thought it was brilliant that she came back on she made a big impact the team got around her and the social media images of her singing her her first cap song afterwards was brilliant and uh yeah no look uh, there's been a lot of talk about her as a young up and coming player, she's only 19, she's been mm -hmm. playing rugby a long time, um, you know, and uh, she could be a really, really good and important player for Ireland in the future. And that was obviously Aoife's first experience and something she'll look back on getting a yellow card. What was yours first cap? Do you remember it, that, yes. that match? So my first cap also was actually against Italy back in 2015. Um, I started on the wing. It was a Friday night game, so I had to wait until like 8 o'clock for kickoff. It was the longest day ever. Mm -hmm. um, it was rainy and drizzly, definitely not a night for a winger. I don't think I got past the ball too many times. but. I was really nervous, um, but also like immensely proud and just couldn't wait for the game to start. I had been capped by the seven team before, so I'd kind of been in similar environments, knew a lot of the players. You know, there was uh, four or five other players, including Sene Naupu, Katie Fitzhenry, mm -hmm. uh, who were getting their first caps that day too, so I wasn't alone in that, but uh, it was an incredible experience. Um, you know, I just even thinking back now to like my first cap song and the whole what, flying what was out, your first flying back song? there uh, for 15. Um, God, probably show my age a little bit, but um, my first cap song was the cup song from Pitch Perfect. Oh um, yeah, yeah. So <laughs> and there's a bottle right in front of you. There. No, no, I'm not absolutely <laughs> not uh, recreating that. But uh, it was actually a really nice atmosphere. As I said, there was five of us who. Um, made our first cap there so it was a really nice environment with one handley we got the bonus point and um we had a nice little dinner and got to to sing our first cap song with the team and it's just a really nice memory and it's a really nice tradition uh, that we have in uh, rugby to kind of have that but yeah look for Aoife she's I'd say she's got a taste of it now and she's just itching to keep her place in that squad you know, kick on, try to become a player, maybe get a starting jersey and, and make an impact, you mm -hmm. know, because that's all players want to do is be the best player they can be. But how can they help the team? How can they make an impact? Mm -hmm. um, before we get into our future game against England, obviously the big one for us, we were chatting earlier with Will Connors to see what he thought about this Italy game. Look, it's great to get a result because I think, you know, new coach and staff, new system, you know, they'd be disappointed with the first two games. And that's just the way it is. But to actually see the, I suppose, the joy coming at like the when they're actually playing that bit of shape again with it's really exciting to watch and getting scores off. You know, the first twenty minutes I'd say they would have been frustrated looking at that. But uh once them all got going, um it was just Italy couldn't handle it. Um but no, I think even looking from previous campaigns I've ever been involved in, you know, it's first two games to lose is difficult but like from here it's all like they're coming off the back of a good win so you don't know where it can go from here I don't really know what's going on in the scrum wheel I'm not going to yeah, lie but uh, from what I could see she was doing a good job in there no and that's the thing you know she's she was controlling it really well setting up a really good platform because at the end of the day forwards it's all about kind of putting putting the team on the front foot you're trying to get that go forward ball and it all starts from scrum and line out and to see the scrum kind of have such a strong platform to play off, it just opens up the back line. And I could, that, like, you know, it is a really exciting back line and you want to get them on the ball as much as possible. So it's a, it's a, I suppose you have to be unselfish in, uh, in the pack in ways in terms of, you know, they're kind of the unseen jobs, you know, locking down a scrum and stuff. But like that's, that's I suppose, the beauty of the game. So obviously good for us, we came away with the Italy win, but in terms of their team, just sort of breaking news, I suppose, they've got the announcement of 25 semi-pro contracts. They're joining England, they're joining Wales, other teams around the world. What do you think that'll mean for the team? Yeah, look, I suppose it can only be a positive for women's rugby as a whole, and, and particularly for uh, Italian rugby. You know, they're going to the World Cup um, this coming um, October, and so, they're obviously looking at this as a way to build and develop their players and improve 
uh, the team in the build up to the World Cup. So look, it's a great opportunity for those players. They've never had this before. You know, they can really focus on rugby right up to that World Cup and then give it their best shot. You know, they were in the last World Cup, but they probably weren't be too happy with um, how it ended for them. And, you know, look, isn't that the dream for, for a lot of players is to be able to uh, be given an opportunity to be the best player you can be in a professional or semi-professional environment. So we're not quite sure exactly what that will entail or how that will work for Italian rugby, but I've no doubt it can only benefit them. You know, they'll be obviously coming off the back of, of three losses out of three now, wondering how do we go, you know, where do we go from here? How do we improve? How do we change this so we can get some positive results? And as I said, it will only make the players better. It will then only make competition in Italian rugby better, uh, which is better for women's rugby as a whole. And, you know, I, I very much welcome that. And the announcement, as you said there, it is off the back of three losses. What do you make of the timing of it? It's interesting, I think, that it wasn't before the campaign or even after. It's just right in the middle of it. Yeah, I don't know. Like, it's hard to know whether players knew about that, maybe before the Ireland game, that this was coming down the line. Was it a knee-jerk reaction that they've realised we're not at the standard we need to be and that these other teams are above us and we need to do something fast? Um, so it is hard to know what they're talking about. But again, like... They obviously feel like this is something they needed now rather than later and so why delay because we're at we have a limited time period before this world cup begins and we need to maximize every opportunity that we have mm -hmm. and it'll be interesting then obviously we came into the italian game knowing there was the possibility of a win maybe when we face them next time it might be different again unfortunately like it was with wales but looking into our next game against england we obviously have all the sevens players, they'll be gone. There's been a lot of talk about it, but can you just explain what does it mean that these sevens players won't be on the team? Yeah, so um, these girls, the likes of Stacey Flood, Eve Higgins, Lucy Mulhall, there's a group of them there. They're all contracted sevens players uh, within Irish rugby. And so what that means for them is that they are semi-professional essentially, and that they um, are, when the Six Nations is not on, they're still training full time um, or part time because they're on what's known as this Sevens World Series. And this is basically like an international league uh, made up of 12 teams, including the likes of New Zealand, Australia, Fiji, Canada, USA, and then European teams like um, Spain, France, England, Russia, all those uh, teams there. and. So they play in a uh, international league that's held in different locations around the world. And so there's a couple of different legs every year. And for the current sevens crop that we're going to lose for these next two games, um, they're heading to the Langford sevens in Canada. It's been a, a stop there on the series for the last five or six years. So they'll go over there and play in a sevens tournament over the weekend. And, and what that essentially entails is they'll be drawn into a pool of four. Uh, other teams they'll play every team once uh, and each game is about seven seven minutes a half so 14 minutes in total so say the tournament starts on saturday they'll play three of those 14 minute games on saturday saturday against everyone in their pool and then depending on how those results go on the sunday uh, you kind of get into the placing so you go into quarterfinals semifinals finals or else ranking places like 9th, 10th, 7th, 8th, 5th, 6th kind of stuff. And so they'll then play two to three games on the Saturday and, or Sunday. And when you finish that tournament, for example, Ireland came second in the last leg of the tournament in Seville, our best ever finish, it was excellent. Uh, they will have gotten a certain amount of points for coming second. And after each leg, your points are added to the table. And at the end of uh, the year, the winner or the one with the team with the most points wins the World Series um, and it's just a great way to I suppose show the growth of sevens you know travel the world you know it's an opportunity to go to countries like New Zealand Australia Canada and um, which you may not get an opportunity with otherwise um, and what why it's massively important and why we're, we're seeing these sevens players leave is one they're contracted and um, so you know that's their priority for the most part mm -hmm. uh, it is a world cup year this year and um, so there's a world cup on in cape town south africa this coming september and um, that ireland hope to be at both their men and women's and 
you know, they need to be building that squad, building experience, getting that depth, putting in good performances so that when the World Cup qualifiers come along, they're in a good position to reach it. Mm -hmm. Not this year, but last year with the Olympics, uh, the World Series is an opportunity to qualify directly to the Olympics. So if you come in the top four of the World Series, you automatically uh, qualify for the Olympics if it's an Olympic year. Um, outside of that, you you can qualify through your regions like Europe and and um, America and all that sort of stuff. So these girls, like they've been playing sevens together for years. You know, they were mainly sevens players before they were given an opportunity to come in and and try and get a fifteens jersey. And so, with it being a World Cup year, with them having performed so well in Seville, you know, I think it is important to understand that they're not just going off you know and doing something else they're going off to play rugby for Ireland at a senior level at an international competition that is really really important and that it's a world cup year and they're building for that so absolutely it's a massive loss and um, so who are we talking so more look I obviously who I know is contracted and who potentially might be going it depends on team selection we're looking at the likes of Bavin Parsons Amy Lee Murphy Crow Lucy Mulhall and um, Stacey Flood Eve Higgins Brittany Hogan, mm-hmm. uh, Avian Riley potentially, um, they'd probably be your your main players from say the Italy game who uh, and from the squad who could be going. That's not to say all of them will go, mm-hmm. but those are players who are contracted to sevens and potentially will go. And the thing is, like, it's again they're going off to play for their country, you know, but it's an opportunity for players who aren't going to step up and, and, you know, see can they make that jersey their own, Mm -hmm. you know, and as I said, they're both senior competitions. They'd love to play in both teams if they could, but unfortunately there's a clash and that's what happens. And, you know, it's a World Cup year, they're prioritising sevens for this and, and that's totally understandable. And will other countries lose the same amount of players as Ireland? Um, I'm not sure about the same amount of players, but we saw with France already, like uh, their number 10, Caroline Drouin, she is an experienced sevens player and so is Chloe Jacquet who played in the centre. Uh, Drouin didn't play last week, it'll be interesting to see, does she play in any more Six Nations games or does she go off with the sevens and the same with, with Jacquet. England, um, I'm not quite sure, Ellie Kildun is a former sevens player, so it'll be interesting to see, is she still there? Alex Matthews, another sevens player who they potentially could lose. But the, the, the issue here and why there's such a media hype, I suppose, is that England have such a huge depth of talent and resources that losing one or two of those, we've already seen the, the amount of changes they've made. Like, they, it hasn't made a difference whether they've been in the squad or not. We're going to lose potentially almost our whole back line. And, it's not that the, the players coming through aren't talented enough. It's that, have we played together enough? Do we have enough experience in there to be able to come through and play an experienced team like England? You know, have we gelled enough? Um, and that'll be the big asking point. And I hope that those girls who come in, take their opportunity, put in a performance. And, you know, those sevens players, if they end up coming back in in the summer for a summer tour or whatever else, that they go, okay, I need to fight for my jersey back Mm -hmm. because X, Y, Z played really well here at the end of the Six Nations. And England will obviously be coming into the match knowing that we're losing kind of a crop of players. We probably have some fresh faces in there. How do you think they're going to approach the game? Are they going to bring in some new caps or what what do you think they'll do? Yeah, look, it's hard. The the game's quite a while away now. Um, I would say that England won't actually massively focus on us too much a lot of the teams do a little bit of analysis and research not so much at individuals but more so at set piece and kind of general style of attack and defense and how they can outmaneuver that um i would suggest that england are working on their own little things they'd like to fix experiment with new players seeing what attack would work against our defense and vice versa um they might kind of go, you know, they're losing a couple of players here, so they've lost, for example, Stacey with their left boot. They might say, well, they don't have a kicking option with a left footer now, so we can attack them this way. But I'd say it'll be a massive focus on themselves before they even look at Ireland. So coming up next, we sat down with Will Connors to discuss how Ireland builds from here after a first win against Italy and taking these positives into the England game next week. 
After that, I'll be back in studio with Hannah Tyrrell, but a quick reminder that you're listening to the Her Sport Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. So, big win for Ireland at the weekend. Um, great for the team to get a win. Ireland 29, Italy 8. Um, like, Will, as a player, how does that feel? You know, third game of the campaign, getting your first win at home in front of a, a nice crowd down in Musgrave Park. How are you feeling? Yeah, no, I look, it's great to get a result because I think, you know, new coach and staff, new system, you know, they'd be disappointed with the first two games and that's just the way it is. But to actually see the, I suppose, the joy coming at, like the, when they're actually playing that bit of shape getting wit, it's really exciting to watch and getting scores off. You know, the first 20 minutes, I'd say they would have been frustrated looking at that. But uh, once them all got going, um, it was just Italy couldn't handle it. Um, but no, I think even looking from previous campaigns I've ever been involved in, you know, it's first two games to lose is difficult. But like from here, it's all like they're coming off the back of a good win. So you don't know where it can go from here. Yeah, absolutely. Like it was a nice game to get the win. You still have two games left to try and improve and build on that. Um, but that that mall defence there, we've seen Neve Jones get the try off that, and it's something obviously that they've worked on this campaign. It wasn't great in the first match. Do you think that really helped them in this game? Like compared to that first game, which we seen their mall wasn't there at all. Well, I think just in general, what we saw in, in that Italy game was that as the game went on, they really grew into it and, and their confidence grew and they started to play a really nice brand of rugby and, and get their explosive, dangerous players going. Mm. But yeah, in particular, our set piece against Italy massively improved. Our scrum looked better. Our line out uh, still a little off and not quite cohesive yet. But as you said, our mall attack worked a little bit better. We got that nice try for Neve Jones, her first a special moment, but the mall defence itself was a little bit better again because again, teams are going to be focusing and looking at that and going, that's an area of weakness. And they kind of improved on a little bit. So And there was a change of players in the team for kind of the first time. We had Hannah O'Connor in there, Catherine Dane starting at nine. Do you think that made a difference to the game? Yeah, I think uh, Greg got his selections uh, pretty spot on and that I'm sure there was a lot of players disappointed. Yeah. You know, we've all been in, in that situation where you're left out of the match day 23 or moved from starting to the bench, but it is in the best interest of the squad for who he picks. And, you know, I thought Hannah O'Connor stepped up really well at number eight. Catherine Dane brought a lot of tempo um, and just that kind of calm, cool collectiveness that you need from a nine. Um, you know, I've been kind of vouching for her to start for a long time and I think I was quite justified. I must be listening in. <laughs> like you yeah. know Catherine Dane quite well and like you know what type of a player she is from her time yeah. at Leinster. And that's the thing, she has such a nice pass and you can see that like uh, the fours are getting involved during interplay because they're able to push that little step wider, she's getting them involved and uh, even from that I found that like uh, Stacey just playing that kind of pressure rugby game, it's like the Italians were throwing a lot at them and then you see Stacey kind of kicking the corners even that what was I want to say it was on 25 minutes she put it into the corner and then Parsons comes and tackles her into touch and it's just like that was the turning of the tide that's where you kind of saw like um, you're like oh yeah look this is they're they're out here to play and now and it was great to see so that's that's exciting to, like going forward that kind of kicking game I know obviously with the seven tournament coming up it could be a different selection but um, yeah. Yeah. Stacey's a and it's like a hugely unpredictable player and I think what makes her so dangerous is that she's really developed that kicking game and she is a really good runner and stepper as it is. She has a wonderful pass and she kept that Italian midfield completely guessing. Beatrice Rigoni from the Italian team is a super player but she wasn't in the game at all because Stacey just had her you know, each time and as I said she was kicking like into corners, pinging it, sticking up high and just kept them guessing and really controlled that game. But she was given good quality ball from her nine and ten to be able to do that. Like, and it, it's great to see them expanding and growing into that and getting the ball to our, our dangerous players. And Eve Higgins then, mm -hmm. she obviously had a brilliant try. It was the I'm sick of talking about Eve. <laughs> try. I feel like every weekend she has a great game. And try the round for her. But what what do you think of her performance so far this tournament? I suppose we've been talking about her every week, but she had another brilliant match. Yeah. So you you kind of yeah. highlighted her earlier as being a kind of a key player and one that you've really enjoyed yeah. watching. Like, and that's the thing. I think. Uh, 
she takes on the line a lot there's there's all plain shape and stuff but when she has ball in hand she's unpredictable she'll you know she'll kind of run at gaps and it keeps defenders guessing and that's the thing she's got that bit of that bit about her that she you can't really take your eye off her and and she has been exciting i think through the whole campaign but even like like i said it was great to see her uh get over for the try a smile on her face i say catherine now she'd be laughing at her kick but uh <laughs> oh, she yeah, meant yeah, that. yeah yeah she yeah, yeah. Meant but that. like you know on, on to her equal but no it was great like you know she has had a great campaign it was summed up really there over the weekend yeah and i, I think it's really starting to show the relationship that Stacy and Eve have you can tell that they've been playing together for years you know they both play at railway they're both in the seven set up and they know each other and complement each other really really well and I think Ireland uh, as a whole are going to benefit from that and they're both able to move the ball and get it to the likes of Baden Parsons, Emer Considine, uh, Amy Lee Murphy Crow and we just want to keep defences from guessing and you know you can't shoot up because they'll kick it in behind you ease off and Stacy will take you on and it's the kind of rugby we want to see and we want to see Ireland on the front foot and we probably didn't get to see that in the first two games. Mm -hmm. And then we had Christy Haney starting as well. What did you make of her? Yeah, look, I actually was really impressed by her. Um, you know, I thought her outing um, against France was really impressive. Nice carries and tackles and she really solidified uh, the scrum up a little bit in the Italian game. Her first start, she's been around rugby a very mm -hmm. long time so I was delighted for her uh, to get her first start in the home crowd and... I thought she did quite well, you know, and it was a nice, calm presence. She's a real calm head in her, and again, another who loves playing the game. I don't really know what's going on in the scrum wheel, I'm not going to yeah, lie, but uh, from what I could see, she was doing a good job in there. No, and that's the thing, you know, she's, she's controlling her really well, setting up a really good platform, because at the end of the day, forwards, it's all about kind of putting putting the team on their front foot. You're trying to get that go-forward ball, and it all starts from scrum and line-out. And to see the scrum kind of have such a strong platform to play off, it just opens up the back line. And I could, that, like, you know, it is a really exciting back line and you want to get them on the ball as much as possible. So it's a, it's a, I suppose you have to be unselfish in, uh, in the pack in ways in terms of, you know, they're kind of the unseen jobs, you know, locking down a scrum and stuff. But like that's, that's, I suppose, the beauty of the game. Yeah, that's what it is. It's that you're working as a unit, as an eight together to provide that go forward ball, get really good uh, movements off it. And, and it is that dirty work that you kind of don't get a lot of praise for. But then again, you have someone like Sam Monaghan who's getting a lot of praise recently and, and it's well deserved because of that dirty work that she's doing. But she's pairing it up with, again, some wonderful tackles, some wonderful breaks and offloads. Um, and... I think she's been a massive addition to this Ireland pack, particularly um, when we've lost the likes of Lindsay Peat, uh, Kira Griffin, Claire Malloy, who added such physicality to our team. And her player of the match, it was nearly like very hard work for her over the course of the whole campaign. But Will, you said there that we have like our explosive backline and obviously we're going to utilise it. But obviously looking ahead two weeks um, into the future, England, we're losing pretty much that whole backline. What do you think that's going to mean for the team? Yeah, well, like it's obviously it's it's disappointing that a few of them are going to be stepping out, but it's also a great opportunity to blood in some new girls, and that's the thing. It's exciting because you know England is a is an incredible challenge, and not many people get the chance to play there. So to open up that opportunity for other girls to get out there, get a taste of the top level rugby, um, that's huge going forward, and you know. Getting the result to be incredible, so please yeah. God. Like I and I I think it's right. Like we've talked about this being a new era, we're building and you know, we're trying to get experience. This is where we build that experience and build that depth. You know, we know now what Stacey Flood and Eve Higgins and Baven Parsons and Amy Lee Murphy Crow and all them can do. And yes, they're gonna go off in sevens and I hope they have a fantastic tournament because they, they're coming off the back of a silver medal, you know, and we hope they can do something similar. Uh, coming up with Langford but this is an opportunity for some of those players that have been training the last six seven eight weeks you know putting in the hard work but not getting a jersey at the end of the day to step up and say do you know what I'm good enough here uh, I'm gonna do everything I can to you know get this team on the front foot and do everything right and hopefully then they can keep a jersey for that Scotland game but it is all about building experience building mm -hmm. squad depth um, and that will only help us in the long run. You know, I'm not sure we'll get a result on the day England are looking yeah. 
you know, pretty incredible. But again, you look at the, the women's soccer team last night, yeah. nobody expected them to get anything out of the, the Sweden game and, and they did. So anything is possible in sport, but it, it will be really great to see girls working, have been working hard, get a jersey, get an opportunity and, and put up a fight. Cause you know, you don't need any, you don't need to ask anybody to, to get fired up again. You're playing yeah. against England, particularly away from home. So and we have the likes of like Molly Scruffle McCabe, like she might come into that back line. So do you think, who would you like to see step up? I suppose there's Maeve O'Galeary as well. Do you think these players will be able to retain positions after? Yeah, look, I suppose you can't, uh, you can't know what's mm -hmm. kind of going on inside Greg's head. And again, they have to take the opportunity that's handed to them if they're given a jersey. But um, down in Musgrave Park at the weekend, they had a couple of extra players with them just in case of injury. But the likes of Molly Scuffle McCabe was there. Um, we also had Michelle Claffey down there, Maeve Ogo Leary. All those were extra players who I would believe will come into the 23 next week. A couple of them are like, you know, Molly is uncapped. Uh, Maeve Ogo Leary has, I think, maybe two caps, one cap. So, that is a it's a daunting place to go to, you know, England, their current Six Nations champions. It'll be tough, but who doesn't want to make their debut against England and potentially cause an upset? And that's the thing, like you said, you don't need any motivation there because, you know, people will be itching for a chance to play over there. And that's, you know, they're, like you said, they're opportunities that are, like, they don't come around too often. And to get a chance, if you get to make your debut over there, um, and that's the thing, but if their backs are against the wall, they could easily pull a result out of there and, you know, it's exciting. And, but like nothing is guaranteed in sport. Just because you had the, the number seven jersey for the last game doesn't mean you're guaranteed it in the next game, even if you played the game of your life. And so those sevens girls who are going off to Langford know that someone else is itching to go to take their place. Um, to take that opportunity and when they come back they're going to have a battle on their hands to, to get a jersey back and that's what you want because competition in the squad improves the standard overall then it improves the team and it makes it competitive when it comes to games and makes you have to be a better player if you want a jersey. And um, what would you both like to see from the game? Obviously England are a kind of favourite. <laughs> Is that too much to ask? <laughs> if the win wasn't on the cards, what would you be hoping to see from what will probably be a lot of new caps and new players in there? I think just um, a lack of unforced errors, you know. So if we could just get our basic handling and execution right, that will create opportunities. Regardless of who you're playing, if you get your handling and execution of plays right, space will open up if, if, we, if everybody does their job right. So against France, we didn't give ourselves an opportunity because we knocked on so many balls and we gave away so many penalties. If we could cut that out you know, and put in a performance and fought for 80 minutes, I'd be very happy with that. Mm -hmm. And Will, what do you think? Yeah, like I'd, I'd love now to see them all going forward again. I think we got a glimpse of how destructive it can be and you'd love to see more of that. But then even defensively, um, you know, I always find you see kind of the, the passion and fight in teams, how they, how they shape up defensively. And I'd love to see that, you know, you know, girls coming off the line, making big hits, you know, trying to, trying to get turnovers. And that's where you see that kind of, that camaraderie, that kind of collective team spirit. I always find that's always in the defence. So I'd love to see a bit of that, but. Question for you. Would you rather score a try or make a dominant hit? A dominant hit all day. It's an interesting one. You'd know he was a forward. <laughs> so obviously with the loss of these sevens players, there's going to be a few changes to your fantasy rugby team. And you're already sitting there top of the table. But what difference is the loss of these players going to make to your team? Yeah, look, I, I think I've gotten really lucky with my fancy rugby teams. I, I think I gave people a tip to back an English winger to be uh, captain last week. And most people probably picked Abby Dow, who was really unfortunate to go off very early in the game with a broken leg. Lucky for you, though. <laughs> I picked Jess Breach, uh, who had just came in and scored a couple of the easiest tries I think she'll ever score and kind of got lucky in that regard. But yeah, I had this week, I had, uh, had to make a few tweaks. Um, and I had Stacey Flood in my team, I had Eve Higgins, um, I had Baden Parsons, you know, um, so I am going to have to make a few changes, but... Um, Who do you think is going to fill those positions in that back line for you? Like, it's hard to call. Um, judging by who they brought down to Musgrave Park as extra players last week, um, 
the likes of Michelle Claffey potentially could come in. She has experience. She would have played England before. You know, Enya Breen has been uh, there, thereabouts with the squad the last uh, couple of camps as well, and or sorry, a couple of games. So I think they could maybe potentially form the midfield partnership again. Uh, Claffey, very experienced. Enya has been around, doesn't have too many caps to her name. She's had a lot of injury worries, but like they're well able to step up and know what's required of that standard. I presume someone like Aoife Doyle will come in off the wing, but I do think we might see a, a new cap in the back line there because we're losing a lot of our back three players. Um, so yeah, I'll have to make a, a couple of changes to my fantasy team. Like It's very hard to judge. England seem to have a new team every week, so you can't really rely on them until the teams are out. But uh, yeah, we'll see, we'll see what teams are thrown out and see if I can stay top of the leaderboard but uh and I'm, I'm not too hopeful <laughs> tactics wise for that english side who do you think maybe in the english backs will will get a look in on your team oh well i like obviously abby Dow is gone uh, so she's a loss so i presume um jess breach will hold her place there um libby thompson might come in on on the wing there or uh yeah Ellie Kildun, if she's still there and not gone with the sevens, that could be their kind of back three that they go for, which is incredible depth to have that uh, and to be able to have those players, you know, come off the come off the bench and, and come into that squad. But I don't know. It's it. This one's a hard one for me because I do like to go for an English winger as a captain because um, I feel like they're going to score loads of tries. But when they're against your own team, it's really hard to pick them. Like, and you kind of got to go head over heart and. It yeah, just comes I'll down to if you want to team... remain top of the table, I suppose. Well, that's it. Like, how competitive <laughs> yeah. are you? Like, obviously, I'd rather pick a load of English wingers on my team and they get no points in Ireland get the win. Um, but, yeah, look, we'll see. The, the thing about this English squad as a whole is every single one of them, regardless of position, are insanely talented. We can see... Um, you know that the professionalism is working and their all of their skills are improving and each week they have so many different try scores so you can't really go wrong with just having a couple of English in your team somewhere and maybe getting lucky and putting one of them as your captain. And then looking ahead so we obviously have the Ireland England game we know kind of the key players well we don't know the key players but <laughs> yeah. we, we can imagine who we're gonna lose and then we've Wales and France what do you think that game will be like? Yeah, see, Wales had an easier start, I suppose, to the schedule. Uh, than that confidence from the Ireland win. Yeah, well. like so they they are only starting to meet England and France now, the two top teams in the, in the competition, and so they had a heavy defeat um, against England. They now have to go to France uh, and and play France, another brilliant team, and I I can't see them winning this one either. You know, I think this will be an easy win for France, and it's just about what French team turns up. You know, do they turn up and absolutely demolish them by 50, 60 points? Or do they score a couple of tries early and then take their foot off the gas and, you know, have a lot of penalty counts and kind of bad decision making, but still win the game easily? Uh, but I definitely can't see Wales um, winning the game, unfortunately. I'd imagine following on from last week with France, they'd nearly be looking to improve fully from when, as you said, like they took their foot off the pedal like the second half. It, they'll probably come in fighting against Wales, who will already be a tough match. Yeah. If you had to put a score on it, what would you say? Um, I'm going to go 47-10 to France. 47-10. But again, that could, that could be way off. The French are so unpredictable. Mm -hmm. And then Italy and Scotland, would you say they're quite evenly matched for the game? To be honest, from what I've seen, like both squads have talent and talented players. It's just they haven't been able to, I suppose, put together a string of phases to be able to show what they can do. Like if you look at Scotland, they haven't won a game yet, but they played England in the first game and... England scored a couple of tries and looked like they were going to run away with it. But then Scotland actually came back and scored a lovely try of their own, showing that they're well able to play good rugby and stuff. But it's whether they can do that consistently. This will be the key to who finishes the bottom of the Six Nations, both going in with, with no wins. Judging by what I've seen from Italy so far, I'm going to... I expect Scotland to shade it a little bit. But again, similar to the Scotland-Wales game, I think it will be a, a very tight one. 
Um, but yeah, I'd expect Scotland to, to get over the line with that one. It, but again, Italy might have those contracts in the back of their mind, kind of buoying them, giving that bit of confidence. And um, so that's a really hard one to call. I'd probably say something like 25, 21 to um, Scotland. Scotland. And then obviously it's the hardest one to pick, but an England, Ireland prediction. Ten nil Ireland. <laughs> no, look. Obviously, I would love. To, I genuinely would love to see an Irish win. Um, I'm sure everybody would. But if we're being realistic, you know, England are odds-on favourites and heavy favourites to win this game and probably win it well. What we've seen from Ireland against Italy is a massive improvement. Their defence has been pretty good for most of this tournament, and I expect that to be no different. But again, we're having a lot of changes in this team. It's going to be a lot of players who haven't played a lot of rugby in the last few weeks and England are firing on all cylinders. So it'll probably, this one's a hard one to put a scoreline on. So I'm just going to say it's going to be an, an easy England win. Mm -hmm. So and coming into it as a player, like for you, when you were up against England, obviously England always have been a dominating team against Ireland. What do you think they're going to do to prepare over the next two weeks? I think that the nice thing that these girls have is that they'll have no fear because nobody expects them to win. Mm -hmm. So they have nothing to lose. And, and that can be the mindset you come in with. Going, we have nothing to lose. Nobody's expecting us to uh, win. You know, England aren't expecting us to, to beat them. And so we need to go out and kind of surprise them almost. And I think they will just be working on the simple things. Simple lineouts, uh, scrum techniques, holding onto the ball. How can we drag England around to create that space? You know, can we have opportunities to kick in behind and get them moving? And it's just about keeping them guessing because if you just play simple one-out rugby where it's really easy to, to defend, those bigger English forwards will eat you up and turn us over fairly quickly. So making sure that our rook is really well secured um, and when the opportunity's on, yeah, move them around and keep them guessing. Mm -hmm. So we're expecting an England win, but hopefully not too large of a win, you'd say. Yeah. My, my head says England, my heart wants to say Ireland. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hopefully we won't see too big of a scoreline and we'll get some new caps in. But this has been episode four of the Her Sport Six Nations show brought to you in association with Opal, the exclusive car partner to the IRFU. You can catch up on this episode and every episode in the series on YouTube and our social channels or listen to the podcast on every podcast app. Her Sports Six Nation Show in association with Opal.